All right. For those that joined us last year, you may recognize our next guest from the big screen. They joined us virtually from Nashville. They're back by popular demand and joining us this year in person. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our next session and our guests, Steve Johnson and Doug Parker. As they come out, I will introduce the two of them. Steve Johnson is the Executive Vice President and Strategic Advisor to the CEO at American Airlines. Steve collaborates with and provides counsel on American strategy development and strategic positioning, economics and competition issues, <coughs> corporate governance, corporate purpose and ESG, and much more. And I uh, should say uh, that Steve, in addition to being a proud Berkeley alum, he's currently teaching two courses at the university, uh, one at the law school and one at the business school. So uh, we're so pleased that Steve is such a generous part of the Berkeley community. I'm sure he'll talk a bit more about that. And joining Steve today has last year is uh, Doug Parker. Doug retired as CEO of American Airlines in March 2022, had nothing to do with his uh, attendance at this conference uh, <laughs> after more than a 35 year career in the airline industry, including 20 years as CEO. He was named CEO of American following the merger of American Airlines and US Airways in 2013. Doug continues to serve American Airlines as chairman of their board of directors. Steve, Doug, thank you so much for joining us again and this year in person. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having us. You want to start? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> well, it's, um, it, it is great to be here and doing this in person this year. But, um, you know, we did at, but when we were, uh, last year we did it at Vanderbilt in this really cool building and we had, it was built as a fireside chat, and we had an actual fireplace. <laughs> yeah, that was nice. A uh, real one that would have come in handy here today, I think. Well, good. Well, thanks. And before we get started, it's really important. As, anyway, as was just described, Steve and I have worked together for a really long time, um, since like 1995 at America West, and then, you, then we merged with U.S. Airways and then American. So um, anyway, you, you will notice quickly that this isn't a normal kind of question and answers. I, I, I rely on Steve for advice and answers as much as as he does me, so. And vice just, versa, for just, sure, So yeah. anyway, so just know that. This is, uh, we've been, we've been, uh, Steve's a great friend. Um, I'm happy to be here again with you all. Um, and, and hopefully provide some, provide some information you find of interest. Yeah, and Doug, I'll just add my thanks on behalf of the forum and the Berkeley community for doing this again. Um, Doug is uh, not just uh, here this week, but he's actually coming back to California next week to guest lecture in my class. So. Um, uh, it's it really great of him. Um, you know, last year we, we had a lot of fun and um, had a really interesting conversation about uh, talking about uh, how public companies are embracing a broader group of stakeholders and um, talked a lot about how American had been doing that for a while and, and, and you know, the benefits that we'd achieved from that. Um, Adam's pretty cool about this. He lets us talk about whatever we want. Um, so uh, this year we thought we'd uh, uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about the role of business in society, um, and especially the role of uh, public companies uh, in society. And of course, the, the background music for this is that uh, society is facing um, an enormously consequential, you know, dare I say, existential set of um, really intractable challenges, you know, climate change, growing inequality, um, uh, you know, voting rights and, and, you know, real threats to democracy, um, threats to economic stability and economic growth in the form of, you know, geopolitics and cyber and et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, all of this is uh, made uh, more complicated by a very polarized political environment that we live in. Um, and indeed, uh, it, that polarized political environment to a great extent is uh, limiting the ability of governments to help us solve those problems. Um, so maybe Doug, in the time we have, I'd like to touch on uh, you know, sort of three broad topics. Um, first, uh, the role of public companies generally and how that's evolved over the 20 years you've been leading a public company. Um, second, um, and, and this is something that you've participated in really extensively, the, uh, but the role of public companies in um, you know, public discourse and politics. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, a topic that I know you, uh, that's really near and dear to your heart is um, uh, how boards have evolved and how we build the, boards to, you know, to be as, as effective in this environment as, as, as possible. Sounds good. 
So let's start. Let's just jump right in. Um, you've been the chairman of the board of a public company now for I, for 22 years or so, if I ca calculate that correctly. Um, uh, just some questions about that. What what do you see the role of the public company to be in society today? Um, how is that changing? Uh, how is that evolving? And and can public companies and corporate the the public company community be a catalyst for further change? Um, okay, there's a lot there. I'll try not to go too long, but. Um, First off, um, change, my, my other view is um, the, the work we're doing is changing, but the role hasn't changed. I think the role was, has always been um, for corporate America um, to be fully engaged in, um, in the political process uh, to the extent it makes sense for the corporation and for the people we represent. Um, it's just that the things that we're getting and have to get engaged in now are different than the past. So. Um, you know, for example, I think we had this conversation last year, so if it's redundant, I'm sorry, but it's, it, it's, it helps set this up. You know, the, the, I'm on the business roundtable. We had this, you know, I, think, I know we talked last year about you know, the business roundtable statement and, and how that was to so many people such a, you know, kind of large event or a watershed event. And um, I, I can tell you for most of the CEOs, it wasn't an event at all. Um, you know, on the business roundtable, I think you know, two or three firms chose not to sign on. <laughs> Um, and, you know, every CEO I talked to was like, well, yeah, of course we represent other constituencies. Um, we, we work for our shareholders. But if you're going to work for your shareholders, you have to go represent, the, you know, the communities you serve. You've got to go represent your customers. You've got to go represent your team. Um, and none of that seemed even remotely controversial to me and I think to most of my peers. So, um, you know, what's different is, that is, where, is, what you, is where you end up affecting that. Um, anyway, my favorite part of that story, and again, I think I, I, think I probably told this last year, but it's, but it's important to me, um, is, you know, when that came out, uh, Gary Kelly, the CEO of Southwest now, um, was, he's not on Business Roundtable. I was at an event with him. He was giving me kind of, he was kind of ribbing me about the Business Roundtable event, and I, said, and I, and I mentioned, yeah, a few, a few CEOs didn't want to sign it, and he just looked at me and said, how can that be? <laughs> he goes, did they not listen to Herb Kelleher? Uh, you know, the famous CEO of Southwest who is, you know, ran the best, you know, airline, who created certainly uh, the most um, shareholder value for airline people and, and share, you know, shareholders ever. And, and, he, and what he was saying, what, he, what I knew immediately when he went, because what he meant was what Herb always said was, I my job is to take care of the customer, take care of my team. They'll take care of my customers. That'll take care of my shareholders. And that's what he did. He didn't just say that to be nice to his team. That's the way the guy ran his company. <laughs> the company is designed to take care of the shareholders. Um, you know, you're just, it's designed to make money or to go away. Um, but what he knew and what most of us know is to do that, your job as CEO is to go make sure that you're taking care of your team. Um, and that's not inconsistent. It's entirely consistent. So anyway, I, I've gotten way off, uh, way off track of your question, but it, it, that's important to me to get that out because um, what I think, you know, today it feels different to others, but it's always been that way. Uh, the difference is just what we now have to get engaged in. Um, you know, I think the polit I believe the politics of business um, is and always has been um, fiscal, fiscal conservatism, <laughs> socially progressive, and globally aware. Um, you know, the first and the third are things that people think business has always been supporting. Um, but look, we we. Our customers are people from all walks of life. Our employees are people from all walks of life. We bring people together, not apart. When the world starts coming apart, our jobs are bring them back together. That's what we do. If we're not, we're not leading. So as the world's gotten more polarized, you've seen us have to do some things to work on things that are more about bringing people together. But that's not, that's not business changing. That's the world changing. Do you think um, that corporations uh, and particular public com companies have a new responsibility to lead in this world? Um, well, <laughs> again, I think the responsibility was always there, um, but others were, others were sharing some of the burden. Um, but as the rest of the world stops doing that, yeah, your responsibility is to keep doing it. So as the, again, as the world becomes, has become of late, um, more polarized, I think you've seen business um, do what business, again, would have done in the past had it been required, um, which is try and pull people back together. Try and be the voice of consensus um, and of you know, working together. 
because um, that's what we do all the time. <laughs> that's what business does. Um, and because of that, you know, had, had, had the situation existed 20 years ago, I think the business leaders of 20 years ago would have been doing the same thing business leaders are today. It's just the situation has changed. Um, so yeah, it may look as though we have to lead um, in areas we didn't lead before, but I think that's just because there's kind of a leadership vacuum that's been created uh, that wasn't there 20 years ago. Thanks. Um, that we, on the other side of the, the, the bay, we, we talk about stakeholder capitalism a lot, and that idea is, is um, fairly well entrenched over there. Um, but one of the things we, we talk about is where do we go from here in that regard? I mean, how does stakeholder capitalism, how does this new you know, or, or continuing role of, of public companies translate into addressing some of these big problems? Maybe t talk a little bit about how you think and how we think in America about climate change and um, inequality, at least in so, insofar as it affects our team members. Okay, help me with what, what, what's stakeholder capitalism? Oh, stakeholder capitalism is the, the business roundtable statement of embracing more stakeholders beyond just your shareholders. It's okay, the, 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 a, the a term I never use would. because I don't think it's a big deal. Um, yeah, exactly. Got it. Um, okay, the, uh, again, I think that's capitalism. Um, so, um, but nonetheless, so what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> how do, how, how, we, how, how do, we, do we take that framework and deploy that uh, as, as um, people in the public company community, as, as the public company community, how does it take that framework and deploy it to solve and to help address some of these problems? Yeah, um, okay, again, I, 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 um, I, I, I try not to repeat myself um, because I think I, think I, I, try, I, think I talked a, I touched a little bit on that. It just doesn't seem dramatically different to me, um, but, but I'll say this, um, that is, which is there certainly is um, some tension uh, that can stop corporations from, um, from, from working on things um, like climate change, uh, things that are clearly important to the world, things that are clearly important to corporate America, um, but um, that can stop, that, that, that really does um, require some, you know, certainly leadership and some, some, some thought change, um, at least in parts of, of corporate America would happen. Primarily, short-termism, if that's a word. Um, you know, when, you know, the fact that so much of corporate America is focused on hitting next quarter's numbers is entirely inconsistent uh, with, well, not entirely inconsistent, but can be inconsistent uh, with working on things that are important for the long term. And there's no better example of that than the environment. Um, where we could all sit around and just pretend it's not a problem, um, certainly for our careers, and worry about hitting next quarter's numbers. Now, I don't think anyone's, you know, anyone's that stupid, um, but you got to make sure that you know that there aren't enough people out there not doing what's needed. So, uh, anyway, uh, so look, I, I think um, you know we worked really hard. We've tried to work really hard um, to always be thinking long term and not get sucked into the worrying about you know if we're going to make 58 cents or 59 cents next quarter, um, and recognizing how trivial that is to the grand scheme of things, and if you know the difference between 58 cents and 59 cents is something that makes sense for the long term, then we're going to focus on the long term. Indeed, if the difference between 58 cents and, and a dime is is something for the long term, we're going to focus on the long term, um, because even even in um, you know the the most um, shareholder friendly um, statements of a corporate purpose, it talks about long-term shareholder value, not next quarter. Um, we all could be doing things for next quarter that aren't good for the long-term shareholders. Um, so you have to be focused on the long-term. And um, so anyway, I, I hope that's responsive, Steve. That, that, that to me is the biggest problem that we face um, as corporations is this, this focus for you know, the short term uh, that um, we need to, we, you need to constantly figure out, keep working to make sure that you're not focusing uh, on the near term for the, at the expense of the long term. Yeah, uh, and I, I, I absolutely agree. And, and I think in some respects, the difference between the short term and the long term is more clear today than ever. I mean, as I grew up in my career, I talked a lot about the long term and I, you know, it was, it, it, it was very conceptual and I sometimes had, a, a hard time 
you know, articulating exactly what the difference between trying to maximize for the long term and the short term was. But now, you know, we've got these problems that if we don't solve them, there isn't going to be any long term in, in, <laughs> right. in some respects. Or the long term is going to be very uh, much more complicated than than the world that we live in now. And it, uh, that's, you know, as I think about uh, <clears throat> corporate purpose and I think about corporate leadership, it's it's I think more about that than I do about the concept of stakeholders. I'm, I'm with you that I sort of think of that as given. I, in fact, in a conversation the other day. Um, somebody was talking about stakeholder capitalism and, and how it needed, or actually about ESG and how it was going to change. And I said, yeah, it should change so that we could start calling it corporate governance. I mean, that's really what we're doing and, and, and what we're continuing to do. But yeah, so, and, and that's a really good point. In the past, in, in prior, you know, 20 years ago when we talked about long term, I, I, would, I would have given the same kind of answer 20 years ago um, that it, short term isn't as bad for corporations. You just think long term. But when we talked about thinking long term then, it was much more about, oh, gee, what's my business going to be like 20 years from now? Um, what's the environment, you know, what's technology going to do to change my business? And we got to be thinking about that. And we got to be out ahead. And we got to, you know, depending on what your business is, you got to work on R&D and those things. If you don't, you're going to die. Um, this is entirely different. This is, you know, we're all going to die. Um, <laughs> and, and you, and you got to be working. And we've got to figure out a way to make that um, a corporate um, requirement. Um, you've been... Uh Particularly when you were CEO, but 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 since then as well, you've been very um, outspoken about certain issues, and indeed uh, have been uh, called by by more than one uh, media representative on the right uh, woke. Uh, um, uh, can we talk for uh, about how you think about participating in politics and the political process as a corporate leader, and how you think about a public company participating in politics? particularly in today's uh, complicated environment? Yeah, I mean, it, it gets back to my introductory comments. I mean, I think um, so much of, look, I mean, we don't, I don't think anyone wants to go wade into, you know, kind of controversial social issues, particularly in a polarized environment, but it, when you, 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 if you're gonna lead, which most of us are, feel like our job is, uh, you gotta go support your team in things, and when, and when um, there are issues out there uh, that, you know, the political process is um, somehow creating to disenfranchise groups of people. I think we have an obligation to speak up and to let people know that's not what, at least that's not what our company wants you doing. I, look, I, I, I represent the people you're disenfranchising and I, I can't stand still. Uh, I don't know how anybody can. I don't know how you can do that and say you're doing your job. So. Um, yeah, look, I, 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 I'm not alone in this. I think much of this, is, you know, much of corporate America now is getting described as woke. And my view is, um, you know, in the past, we, you know, I spent a lot of time in Washington D.C., you know, lobbying for tax reform, and no one, no one complained about that um, because that's, you know, and lobbying about, you know, how unfair practices from, you know, foreign airlines. And no one complained about that. Um, it's, you know, but, but if you say, you know, look, I, I represent some people who feel disenfranchised because, you know, you're, you've chosen to pass some bathroom bill that says, you know, they can't use the bathroom that is consistent with the gender they identify with, um, all of a sudden, you know, we're not staying in our lane. It's like, it's, it's, it's things seem exactly the same to me. They're just not <laughs> the same issues that were traditionally um, were engaged in, but they're the same. And more importantly, when <clears throat> you know the state where we're headquartered decides that they're going to, then, the, then the name of um, voting integrity, they're going to make it harder for certain groups of people to vote. Uh, and I've got, you know, he, I'm hearing from. Um, members of our airline, uh, employees, that that's, that, you know, what are you going to do about this? Um, we're a big employer in this state, and what they're doing is making it harder for people like me to vote and to be represented. Uh, and when people like, you know, Ken Chanel and Ken Frazier and another, whatever it was, 100 black executives send a letter saying, this is important to business, um, please get involved, you got to get involved. So I don't, again, that, that doesn't, um, that seems like my job to me. It doesn't, it, didn't, it doesn't even raise to the level of how do we, do we engage. Uh, it just raises to the level of what's the best way for us to engage. How can we actually make a difference? What can we do that matters? 
Um, so look, we can engage on those things. I, 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 so I, it, it feels like my job. And <clears throat> as you thought about this and as you think about it going forward, how do we navigate the, this, uh, these very choppy waters? You know, on the one hand, we have the new right um, calling us woke, uh, but on the other hand, we, uh, you know, on the other side of the coin, we have uh, the left, um, you know, suggesting that corporate America are foot draggers and, and um, you know, in some cases, you know, villainizing corporate America for its role and its uh, um, uh, slow response to, to climate change. Those are, those are complicated things and you see it, it, it play out in a number of different ways. I mean, just media attention first, uh, but you, you know, you've seen these, you know, boycotts by some states uh, to, against, you know, investment banks and BlackRock for, um, you know, its positions, uh, boycotts, um, uh, for other things, uh, customers, uh, you know, probably have written you letters uh, saying they're never going to fly American Airlines again because of a position <coughs> you've taken. How do you feel about those, and how do you navigate those waters? Yeah, thank, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, you do what's right, um, and you know. And again, we're, I, I know we get accused of picking sides on this, and I know I don't. I don't believe we're picking sides. We're trying to pull people together. Um, and get people to talk to each other as opposed to picking one side or the other. It just turns out to be that sometimes when you're encouraging people to talk to each other, you're encouraging someone that hasn't talked to, to the other side who is, happens to be in the, in the, on the brink of getting something passed to say you disagree with what they're going to pass. <clears throat> but, you know, again, when it was, again, back to the Texas voting um, um, legislation, you know, that that came up quickly, you know. We're in, and you know, you're you're just scurrying to say no and figure out. And but our, our it, we didn't. We, our statement wasn't, oh, gee, don't go pass the legislation. What we were saying was, will you please go talk to each other? You know, no one's no one's opposed to voter integrity. Um, you know, Ken Cheneau isn't opposed to that. He's just opposed to the, the, your solution to it, making it harder to for people like himself to vote. Um, and why don't you guys go work this out? Smart people should be able to work this out. If you're concerned about voter integrity, get in a room with the people that are concerned about, you know, making it harder for the people to vote and see how you can get both of you to be happy. And of course they didn't want to do that because it wasn't about voter integrity. Um, but you sniff things like that out by asking people to talk to each other. So I don't know, I, anyway, the, the, the short answer to your question is you don't get worried about what people are gonna say. Uh, you don't get worried about um, what, um, people may do even. You just go do what's right to represent the people that you're supposed to represent and you move on in a way that is consistent with your job of, of running a large organization that has um, people that, that in your care uh, that feel as though they're being disenfranchised, that you happen to agree with that they're being disenfranchised uh, and that you have a voice that can represent them and you should use it uh, when you can. Um, to the extent it has an effect. So, I don't know, that's, that's what I think. I, I think it's um, much more about trying to pull people together than picking one side or the other. Uh, that's always what it's about, uh, trying to move people more to the middle instead of keeping, instead of running off to polls and certainly, um, you know, trying to, to um, discourage people from disenf disenfranchising large groups of others. Are there topics that, uh corporate America should weigh in on and topics that corporate America should stay away from? Um, but is there a calculus that you use to decide, you know, what is something that you should speak out on and what is something, you know, that you shouldn't touch? Um, that's a good question. I mean, in general, I would say no, but it, but it comes back to, it, it doesn't make sense to just be sending out press releases and not making a difference. Um, you know, it, 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 what matters is if you can actually, make, if you can have an effect um, again, so when, you know, voter legislation uh, issues were going on in Georgia, uh, American didn't chime in. Um, we're not big in Georgia. When it was in Texas, um, and when, you know, team members, like I said, were rightfully pointing out to me, you can make a difference here, please do, we chose to chime in. Um, so, um, you know, it, 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 it matters more where you can actually have an effect. Um, you know, if I'm asking a question, I'm going to answer it no matter what. But it's, um, but really, actually choosing to engage like we did in Texas was more about because we had the ability, we thought, to make a difference. Uh, that our voice mattered, and if your voice matters more, certainly it makes more sense to get engaged. Um, but I don't know, that's what I think. How do you feel about companies um, 
more directly engaging in politics, supporting candidates, um, supporting causes, um, you know, selection day. Uh, we, we, we still uh, don't see uh, uh, the public company community um, uh, speaking out on behalf of uh, candidates that they prefer, candidates they don't prefer. I mean, it's obviously um, dangerous ground, but, but it's also could be part of leadership in an environment like we're seeing in today's election, for instance. Well, yeah, I, um, I, it's hard to find candidates um, right now that are doing what we're talking about, right? So, um, I mean, yeah, look, I, I know America goes and we support candidates on both sides, um, largely because of, you know, what committees they're on or um, who they represent, which happens to be, you know, where we have large operations, things like that. Um, but it's hard to go find anyone who's actually, you know, what you'd love to do is say, I'm not going to, rep I'm going to represent only those who are pulling people into the center. Um, that's what I'd like to be doing. Um, that's what we want to encourage. There's, go find them. Um, you know, something in the process is broken, uh, where structurally wrong, uh, where in today's Senate, um, I don't know, you know, we're going to, there's, there are, to stretch it, 15 senators out of 100 uh, who might, you know, be willing to work with the other side, really work with the other side. You know, when in the structure bill, there's, there's always a gang of 10 or 11 or 12. There's not a gang of 40. Yeah. Um, there, there's, you know, 10 people. There are 15 people that are willing to cross. That, that, means, that means 10 to 15 percent of the Senate is representing, I don't know, define the center, 60 percent of us. You know, 20% on each poll, which I think is probably high. 60% of us are represented by 15%. You know, if someone, if 60% of the population is east of the Mississippi, and we chose to give that all those people only 15% of the votes, there'd be an enormous cry of we're underrepresented. There's a structural problem in the way we are electing people today uh, that the 60% of us are represented by 10, 15%. Um, so I don't know that. Um, choosing to contribute to someone in that broken structure doesn't just perpetuate the structure. Um, and rather, if we shouldn't be trying to figure out a way to fix the, fix the structure itself. Find other candidates. Fix the structure. I, I, look, I think the problem is um, the way we elect people. And if you're elected in a process that says, um, you know, there are going to be 12 candidates, um, for, for a Republican senator and whatever, five candidates. Um, there be five candidates, and we're going to run a and we're going to run a primary, and you know only the Republicans vote in this, and only the Democrats vote in this, and you got to pick one of the five, and whoever gets the most votes wins. They tend to go as far right or as far left as they can uh, to win their primary, and once you win the primary, then that's who we have to vote from these two polls. Uh, whereas if you know, I don't know. Pilots Union in America doesn't let doesn't elect their president until they get fifty percent of the vote. You know, if there are five candidates and none of them get none of them get the majority, then they do a runoff. And you'll get people that are more in the center if you do that. But the way we tend to do it um, results in um, so look. I'm I'm now wading into areas that maybe. But I, look, I think that is a bigger thing that we as business could try to f help facilitate. Uh, than trying to say, oh, I'm only going to support candidates that are in the center because they don't exist. They get they get primaried. Great. Um, let's um, talk about boards. Um, in this complicated environment, um, uh, we need really good boards of directors. Uh, you've spent 22 years leading a board. Um, that board's gone through. Uh, enormous change over that time through two mergers and through um, just uh, uh, board transition and board refreshment. What do you think about boards in today's world? And, and maybe a after talking about that, tell us how you think about building boards and, and you know, what you look for in adding directors to a board um, and how you think about boards over a longer term. Um, sure. Uh, I'll preface all this with yeah, I've been chairman of the board for 20 years, but I was also CEO for those 20 years, and I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm a management-friendly board member um, because, because, I was, because that was more of my job than running the board, so just know that. Um, he says that, but I've been with him for the last 20 years. 
I, but I am. I, but anyway, so this. But but I believe. Anyway, this is my perspective. I'm just noting that it may be skewed. Um, and um, so that's that's what I believe. I think the, I think the role of the board is to, well, is to largely to help management uh, go create shareholder value. Um, I think. Um, you know, I think that a large part of the board's role, which no one finds very sexy, but is important, is just to be there to make sure the, the to make sure the shareholders' interests are protected. They don't need to do that for most management teams. Um, I don't know what you know, ninety-five percent of management teams are out there working on behalf of the shareholders and don't need anybody to look over their shoulder. Um, but you know, we've certainly seen instances where that didn't happen. You need to have a board, and that's what the board's job needs to be. And it's not that much fun, but that's why you have audit committees and um, things like that that just make certain that that management team is working not for themselves or not for anyone else, but they're working to make sure the shareholders' interests are being um, it, it, are being vested. And that's that's a big part of that's why you have that's why we do have audit committees, and that's why the boards make just show up and make sure the management team is doing the right things. Um, that's an important role, um, not the sexiest, not about strategy or um, you know, 30 years from now, but I think that's a really important role and one that the board needs to play. Uh, and management should be supportive of that, particularly managers that are, that are doing the right thing already. So that role exists and we shouldn't lose sight of it. Um, and beyond that, as I guess part and parcel of that, that, in, that includes uh, making sure that that management team is thinking longer term. Um, the, the value the board's added to me over the years is um, those that work in other, you know, are on other boards or in other industries, and they come and say, well, you know, here's what we're doing on this issue. Not an airline issue, kind of you know, either a governance issue or a more global issue. Um, and it's like, well, that's, that's extremely helpful. So I think boards add value in that regard. Um, and, but anyway, to the, um, you know, to, to, you know, as to, you know, what's changed, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I do know at least 20, 30 years ago, the perception of boards anyway is like it was a club, um, you know, just, it, it was there primarily, you know, just you know, pass the pate and let's just make sure we all, in, all enjoy ourselves. And it was, it, was, it was much more clubby and now it's gotten to be much more, um, Independence, which I think is good. Um, what I what I worry a little about is that that push toward independence becomes a push toward um, managing, uh, becomes a push toward um, fear of of a board who finds himself uh, being questioned uh, because the management team took a risk, and you want management teams taking risks. Um, but there's that it just gets so much that it, we're that we're moving potentially uh, into situations where the board um, wants to be so independent of management um, that they that they're not supportive of management uh, and that they 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 some can get to where they uh, worry more about the board and the proxy and how they're, what their votes are going to be um, than, you know, what's, what, what they should be doing, um, which is making sure, which is ignoring those things, um, doing what's right, making sure they're doing what's right, responding if they're asked a question, um, and having a good answer because they know what they did was right, um, and allowing the management team and encouraging the management team to go take risk. Uh, to go out there and do what they're supposed to do, uh, with always with an interest of doing what's right for the shareholders and the communities and, the, and their customers and their employees. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's, the old model was not a great model where it was clubbier. Um, the new model is better where it's independent, but there's a risk of independence becoming a new organization. Is there um, a, a, a type of person that you think about as being a really additive to boards in the future that, that hasn't been represented on boards historically? Yeah, I don't know. Again, it obviously matters for the board, for the corporation, what the corporation needs, what that CEO needs. Um, I can tell you for us, we're in this transition now as, I, as I'm um, no longer CEO. We have a new CEO. The new CEO, you know, is looking is looking for a different kind of board than I had. Not sure, maybe we have a great board, great board members, uh, but for him, he would like more 
kind of sitting CEOs and uh, people that, that, um, that we have on the board today. Uh, so we're working to do that. I, and I, frankly, I think he's right, certainly, um, for today's world. More people that have, um, I think, um, you know, sitting CEOs or something close to a sitting CEO um, who does appreciate that independence is important, but also, um, you know, that it would really help um, if that independence included um, helping these people do their really their jobs that are really hard um, and giving them the support they need and not causing them uh, to have to do a bunch of work that is not supportive of um, what needs to be being done on, on behalf of the corporation. Um, so that, that might be one. I, 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 uh, what about I'll get in trouble with a bunch of governance people. Yeah. I, I, worry that this, <laughs> I worry that these boards that are created with, oh, we need to have an ESG expert, we need to have a, a legal expert, we need to have, we, these, these kind of, we're gonna recreate the corporation um, in our boardroom. Um, so that we have someone that can question the company's ESG expert, um, and so we have someone that can question the company's IT department, um, which is what it feels like, and maybe, and maybe it's not what people are talking about when they do it, but you certainly run the risk if that's what you do. If you just go create the CEO's organizational structure at the board, <laughs> if you have a finance, if you, here's our finance guy, here's our marketing person, here's our, here's our ESG person, and all those people believe their role is, is to go and add the value that they, the information that they've gleaned in their career, which is really helpful, done right, but can be harmful if it's just meant to every three months show up and um, ask people to report back into them um, the way they're doing their jobs so that they can see it's consistent with the way the board used to do their jobs. Cool, I, I thought about, uh uh, winding this up by asking you the question about uh, asking you the question of whether you're optimistic about the future, but I already know the answer to that question um, at, at, with an exclamation it? point. Yes, yeah. uh, with an exclamation point. Okay. So let me ask a slightly different question, but to try to capture the same thing. And um, I'll give a, a, a salute to a guy uh, that I have a, a, that I hold in pretty high regard, Mark Carney, who was a former uh, chairman of the Bank of England, is now very focused on uh, sustainability and. Uh, but he, he coined a phrase called the um, tragedy of the horizons, which he describes as being uh, the world in which we live in that, that's run by people that are your and my generation, um, but dealing with problems that are gonna really come to bear and manifest you know, in the lives of another generation. Um, and you and I have this really great privilege and great experience of spending a lot of time with uh, very bright, very well-educated, um, generally progressive younger people, um, uh, you know, at American, uh, uh, you know, me at the university, our uh, outspoken progressive children. Uh, what, when, when younger people ask you about the future, what do you say to them? And, 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 and particularly younger progressive people who are in some cases pretty skeptical of the business world and the business community and maybe even willing to call out the fact that big businesses played a role in the creation of some of these problems. How do you speak to them about this? Um, the honest answer to that question is like when my kids start bashing capitalism, I just, I just let it go. Um, <laughs> because they're leading this ridiculously privileged life uh, that is the result <laughs> of my participation in capitalism. And to point that out to them seems futile. I mean, if they can't see it, <laughs> if they can't see it, for God's sakes, you know, anything I say is not gonna make a difference. So my, what I, my honest answer to that is they'll learn. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's cool that they're going through that. And it's neat that they actually have those thoughts and they're trying to think of a better way to run the world and they're not sure this is right and you know, irrespective of where they're, the environment they're sitting in as they, as they, as they, um, as they discuss it. Um, so, but if, yeah, but if they were to ask, and honestly, you know, and, and anyone that would ask me this, what I'd say is this, look, yeah, of course there are issues and there are gonna be issues. Uh, in our country and society going forward, but by far uh, the best system that's been created to deal with those issues is um, the system of the United States, a democracy uh, that um, is, is based on capitalism. Um, uh, you know, where everybody's vote matters, uh, we, we're governed by people that are elected by the majority, 
and um, that are that are designed that is designed to have checks and balances that allows everyone to have a voice and allows and should allow um, for us to you know make decisions that benefit the whole of society. Um, that's a great that's a great structure, and the best economic environment you can create for that is a capitalist society where you know people go out and you know make a difference and should have equal opportunity to do so. Um, and if you give them that opportunity, the best and the brightest go do amazing things and create and create amazing uh, structures and solve problems like the ones we're talking about. So I think it's an, I think that's why I am optimistic that that'll rule the day. Those things will rule the day. Uh, we're we're all struggling with a lot of things right now that are different than they were before, but they were they were different 40 years ago. Uh, and what matters is having the right structure in place. I think we have the best. Um, it can always get better. Um, we should encourage people to try and do everything they can to make it better. And, and asking questions is fine. Um, shouldn't be defensive about it. But I, I just happen to believe, you know, our structure will prevail. Thanks. The red light's on. So thanks very much. Right, thanks. Thank you for your thanks. time. Thanks. Thank you. So if uh, Doug and Steve return again next year, we all get platinum status at American. <laughs> so make sure to tell them how much you enjoyed their talk. Thank you both. So as an assistant dean, I actually have the right to assign anyone homework, including folks that aren't my students. And I want to encourage you all, if you enjoyed this conversation, uh, we're also joined by uh, my colleague, Professor Amelia Miazad, uh, who put together the Business and Society Chorus that Steve's now teaching at Berkeley. Uh, she also developed an incredible online executive chorus that you all should take called Sustainable Capitalism and ESG Online. If you go to executive berkeley.edu, uh, you can see and visit that chorus and learn about our other offerings.